أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات الله محمد وعلى محمد All praise belongs to Allah and I begin in His blessed name for granting us this life and giving us the opportunity to exist and for granting us the intellectual power by which to dictate our own future through sight and hearing and to be able to logically analyze and rationalize the purpose of life. For there are those who say God doesn't exist. They argue that life has no real purpose except temporal purpose, transient purpose. And all of these are important because if you and I do not have the longevity of purpose, then the goodness of our actions gets minimized. So for example, if I believe that good is only for a hundred years, then technically it's not really good. If you say to somebody, I will be honest with you for 10 years, but after that I'll stop being honest, or I love you for 50 years, but then I'll stop. Imagine a father says to his son, I will only love you till you reach 50, and then after that I'll stop loving you. The meaning of love dies away. It has no meaning. But you say, but for 50 years I will love you. Isn't that important? I'm a utilitarian father who is going to love you temporarily since this is a temporary world. But then after that, my love will vanish. Your value system immediately begins to cancel that value because it says under that condition, then since you've put a time factor by which to, <clears throat> to end this positive be character, then this character is really not positive because it will end and it has no value, therefore. <clears throat> it's like saying, get your degree, but after so many years, it'll fade away and it'll have no value. Go to school and get your education, but then after so many years, it'll have no value. You will notice that anything under the good factor, if it lacks the eternal value, then it ceases to be as good as it's supposed to be. So goodness has a direct correlation to an infinite argument, meaning anything good has to have an inf infinite power of growth. Meaning not only should it exist infinitely, but it should grow infinitely. So good should multiply infinitely, otherwise good is marginalized, it doesn't have meaning. Just like you cannot say to your loved one, I will love you for a short time. You have to say, I will love you forever. Fairy tales also, you know, they lived happily ever after. You cannot end a fairy tale by limiting time to the goodness in the end. So the eternal factor is the driving force of our moral argument. This is where atheism seriously falls apart. It lacks any value because it doesn't have the eternal power of moral goodness. And eternal power of moral goodness is impossible without a being that is eternal and good. If you remove God from the equation, then nothing makes sense in the eternal sense and nothing therefore actually has any value of good. It's an interesting fact, what I've just done, said in summary form, is very, very powerful. I want you to focus on this. I know I've said it very quickly. And sometimes you sort of have to refresh it. What did you just say? Hold on, I gotta think about this again. I would advise us all to seriously consider what was just said. Because any one of us that has any issues or questions with regards to the hereafter, day of judgment, God, 
<clears throat> you will notice that without this argument, nothing makes sense. Please bear in mind. When we teach our children something, we always have it in the back of our minds that what I'm going to teach my child will have an eternal good to it. You would never teach a child for temporal good. It's, it's an exercise, we call it an exercise in futility. It's actually stupidity. So having said that, the eternal factor is very important. Then I want to bring into focus our thoughts and our imagination and therefore our actions. If they are not predicated on an eternal thought, if they are not predicated on an eternal growth of goodness, then it's really an exercise in futility. It's, it's worthless. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Hashr, the 50, 59th chapter, verse 13, verse 18, I'm sorry. Ya yuhal ladhina amanu attaqullah wal tanzur nafsun ma qaddamat lighad. O you who believe, guard yourselves with God consciousness. Okay. Wal tanzur nafsun, take account, meaning that um, know that every soul should consider what it is sending for tomorrow. Ma qaddamat lighad, for tomorrow. What are you doing for tomorrow? Very important. And be careful of your duty towards Allah. Surely Allah is aware. Now, why does Allah keep saying be careful of your duty to Allah? Because Allah is the ultimate eternal tomorrow. All good, as I mentioned, has no value if it lacks eternity. Don't forget that. Please understand, and I'll repeat it. Good lacks value if it's not eternal. Please understand that. There is no eternal but Allah. So all good is from Allah and it returns to Allah. And therefore when God says be God conscious, what he means is the only way to keep your good eternal because eternity is with Allah, good is with Allah, and all good is eternal. Therefore when you do good, don't forget Allah. Very, very simple, but it is extremely profound. If you break any of these sentences, it will shatter the very notion of good. I promise you. Okay, please follow this carefully. So when Allah says, Allah, Be God conscious. Allah is saying the good that I'm inviting you to, which you want to be, which you want to have, must have me in it. Otherwise it's not good. For anything that lacks my presence in it is temporal, therefore it's not good. Allah says, فَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِالتَّاغُوتِ وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ إِسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوَثْقَى لَمْ فِصَامَ لَهَا وَاللَّهُ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ If you give up the demigods, meaning if you give up the false gods who are not eternal, if you give up the temporal gods, if you give up the distractions of that which is not true, meaning if you stop going towards false ideas. فَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِالتَّاغُوتِ Ta'ghut is anything other than Allah in goodness. وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ And you believe in Allah and you hold on to Allah, then you will be holding on to a rope firm and Allah says لَمْ فِصَى مَلَهَا Here لَمْ فِصَى مَلَهَا meaning it shall not break. It doesn't mean it shall not break today or tomorrow. <clears throat> it shall never break. Never means forever. It's eternal. Meaning the good that you've just done by rejecting the demigods and holding on to God, you are holding on to a rope that will never break. Meaning it is firm. And look at the word rope here. وَيُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ إِسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَى It's very deep. You know, it, when you look at safety, as I mentioned yesterday, taqwa, the root word means protection, guardianship. Protect yourself from the dangers, the evils of society. People aspire to have money. They aspire to be retired early. Why? Because they want protection. People go to the gym to work out because they want protection from illness. 
They want to be healthy for as long as they can be healthy. They want to prolong their lives. These are all under the parameters of protection. Protection, guardianship. When you and I protect ourselves, then we become safe and secure, which is what makes us believers. Ya ladina amanu. Oh, you who are secure. So imagine, this is the reality. You'll find no religion whose nomenclature, meaning the naming convention and the use of words, is more practically applied as in Islam. Even as I mentioned, the name Islam, which means peace and submission, is the only name on earth named to a religion, in a religion, by a divine being, appropriately. All other religions are named after objects and people. Just the naming convention, just the name factoring has been foolishly done by other religions. Islam is the only religion named properly, appropriately, that were you to de split it and slice the word, it's so alive that it's guiding you even by its own name. And when Allah is using the verses in the Quran, when you split the words, you will find that the reality of these words are so multidimensional that no matter how you cut them, it's telling you the truth. This is the beauty of Islam. You read the Bible, you read the Torah, you read the Bhagavad Gita, you read the Sanskrit, nothing, nothing with all due respect, comes even close, even close. Forget about comparison. It's like earth and sky. Quran is a unique book in the world. And when Allah is telling us, nafsun ma qaddamat li ghad. Check yourself. Every word has been split beautifully. When Allah says, Taqillah, it's so synergistic. It's so tuned with reality. I always wonder, Islam is the most vilified, attacked religion since the Prophet's time. The enemies have consistently and persistently attacked Islam. Incessantly, as we say in English, they have not ceased, they have not stopped, and they have found every reason to attack Islam from every angle. And yet Islam as a religion continues to grow among the people, and people are taking religion, Islam, more than any time in history. And here's the other logic, which is very, very profound and very interesting. You would think that Islam outwardly appears to be a very male-oriented, very patriarchal religion. It's very male-centered. The man seems to get the bigger chunk of God's mercy, it appears. And the woman tends to get the short end of the stick. It appears. It's not true. It's a lie. These are accusations. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has elevated both genders equally. Ya ayyuhal ladina. You know, when Allah says, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila lita'arafu. O mankind, we have made you into male and female nations and tribes so you know each other. Meaning these differentiations are a blessing of God. But the most honorable to God, inna akramakum inda Allah atqaakum, the most honorable to Allah is the one who is God conscious, meaning neither male nor female is superior, both are. Meaning individually they're not, they both are. Nations and tribes are all beautiful. Lita'ara for these are blessings of God. So you would think, because of the hijab, for example, the enemies of Islam have tried to present the argument that, look, the woman is considered a second-class citizen by being told to cover herself when the man doesn't do that. Or when they pray, the woman is behind, she's second-class citizen. These are all accusations. Or when she inherits, she inherits half of the brother. You see? Look at this. It's such a patriarchal religion, so male-oriented. Sadly, and I must make a quote here very quickly, footnote. Sadly, many Muslims have been very, very unfair with the female gender. Sadly, historically, the men, the male gender has been very stupid in its own race to marginalize the other wing of the bird. As I say, Islam has got two wings, 
the left wing and the right wing, and you don't cut the wings off and flip it, and you don't make the left, left wing look identical to the right wing because then the bird cannot fly. It needs to be a mirror image, and you don't clip one wing because you'll go into a tailspin. You have to allow both wings to flap equally with equal weight, and sometimes one wing flaps harder than the other if it's going to do something. But there's no rule in Islam that God says one side is superior to the other. It's a dumb argument. But why am I bringing this argument forward? You will find statisticians have noticed among the two genders, it's the female, the women, the girls, who are becoming more Muslims from non-Islam to Islam than men. Interesting statistics. The evangelical societies have noted that women are becoming, are converting to Islam more than men. Now you would think, hold on, intuition tells me that Islam appears to be marginalizing the female race. It appears to make them second class citizens. Why would these women who are not Muslims become Muslims under these conditions, given the fact that media is also exaggerating this reality? Because Islam is a natural synergistic religion. It aligns with fitrah. And unless you have, a, what they say, a bone to pick or an ax to grind, meaning unless you have animosity and hatred towards something, if you and I are sincerely seeking the truth with a sincere heart, then you will definitely have to come to the deen of God which is Islam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So, the reason I'm speaking like this is because you will see that the nature of Islam is so natural in its resonance. But many a times we have ignored the beauty of its natural state, like salah, fasting, hajj, hijab, modesty. We have attacked it. We've rejected it. Not rationally, but impulsively, by comparing ourselves with the ignorant. We've looked around and the gloss and the glitter of the other side appears more attractive. And rather than think carefully about the consequences of rejecting the gifts of God, we have become impulsive by attacking it without any thought. Just like those who reject God without any thought. It's like atheists who tell me, I don't believe in God. I said, what's your evidence? They say, I don't have an evidence. I said, you're being impulsive in your statement. Bring me rational arguments. Submit to the nature of the reality and then give it to me from that angle. Don't have hatred for something and therefore your justice is skewed. وَلَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمًا عَلَىٰ أَن لَا تَعْدِلُوا do not let the hatred prevent you from being just. Be just. It is closer to God consciousness, to piety. How do we get there? The foundation I just laid is the eternal factor. When Allah says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un, indeed we are from Allah and we return to Allah. Allah is the eternal one who brings everything into existence. Even atheists who don't believe in God like Stephen Hawking stated that at the Big Bang moment prior to that, no scientist can discuss that matter because there are no tools of science that exist prior to the Big Bang moment, which is known as Planck's moment. He said, we scientists cannot talk about it. And it is false for us to speculate about it because the tools of science don't work. But he does allude to the fact in his book, Brief History of Time, that the philosophers can do that because they're empowered with the ability to go back and forward in time philosophically. So the, philosoph the philosophical argument dictates that from nothing comes nothing. We are something, but no thing can dictate its own existence when it is nothing. Therefore, whatever dictated this existence must have always been there. Otherwise, it's illogical. And whatever has always been there must always remain there infinitely, for it's impossible any other way. This is Allah. 
والآخر والظاهر والباطن this, these arguments are irrefutable as I say impenetrable in its strength with all due respect and why am I speaking this way I want our yaqeen our certainty to increase for when it does increase it allows us to touch reality better and we become more pliant we become more submissive we become more touched with reality we become more sincere with the truth that's very important please understand that it's the eternal factor of the divine that's very much in the conversation now so it's the akhirah that you and I must always be thinking about and I'm going to talk about it briefly that future Islam is a future thinking religion and I'm saying this again Islam promotes future thinking it acutely makes me aware of the present it describes with detail the past but it prepares me elegantly beautifully efficiently for the future don't forget that Islam is a religion that promotes the future for you and I to achieve the future you and I must exercise thinking with imagination for the future and plan out our future if we don't we would say we are happy-go-lucky and people who live happy-go-lucky it sounds nice carefree but it's dangerous because as you say live by the day with no plan for tomorrow is a dangerous way of living because if you and I don't know the consequences of today that will cause my tomorrow then we're living a dangerous life so let me summarize that you and I are who we are today because of the thoughts we had in the past about our future we are who we are today and I want us to remember this when you look in the mirror and say who am I today why am I this way I'm married I have children or I'm not married or I'm doing this I'm a professional right I'm here I'm there I want you to understand one thing ask ourselves why am I here doing what I'm doing today and why is my character this way you will see carefully and if you go back in your life that those were the thoughts you had and that is why you're here today the way you are we are the product of our past thoughts don't forget that our predictable future as they say right is the present we pre we present ourselves for the future so Allah says take account of this future be kind be generous be patient be careful of your duties and obligations for if you are reckless in what you do today it will dictate your future and you may end up in a hole that you can't get out so the imagination of the future is very important people like Mahmoud Abdul Rauf for example simple example you find that he achieved the NBA as a superstar in his era when the probability of a person like him achieving is very very low they say it's there's a higher probability of a meteor hitting you than for, him, for you to become an NBA superstar. And bear in mind, Mahmoud Adarouf is only, what, 5'11"? Not a tall guy. He's not like a 6 foot 6, 6 7. Typically, basketball requires that kind of height because all the pros are like super giants, right? Tall. Their hands are like massive. They hold the basketball like it's a little donut. Here's Mahmoud, who's got Tourette syndrome, right but at a young age at the age of six he had a vision and his future thinking was so clear he wanted it so badly coming from a poor family the probability of succeeding to go into a basketball camp etc etc are all weighing against you being a colored person right racism in the south in Mississippi is heavy I mean you and I as Muslims today when Islam is being marginalized we feel heavy some of us want to change our names we want to run away you know we want to assimilate the Western ways just to escape any sort of attack imagine being born with a darker skin where the world has set a standard that you are second class third class no matter what you do 
which is what Iblis promised. And I'm going to get this Adam, dark-skinned creature. I'm going to get him. So a person like Mahmoud growing up, that everybody would whisper into your ears, you can't make it, sorry, you can't make it. Don't even try. How many students I know who go to school and people whisper into their ears, ah, what are you studying for? You're going to that school? Give it up. Don't even try. You're not going to make it. You know, your intelligence is not there. Your brother is smarter than you. Your friends are smarter, etc., 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 etc. So true, isn't it? I remember when we were building this, this, this school, people said, are you out of your mind? You're going to build a school with millions of... Where is your money? You have like a bank account that you have flooded with money? I said, it's not money that builds buildings. Money is plentiful. Trillions of dollars. What are you talking about? Yeah, but you don't have it. I said, I don't need it. Well, what do you, don't you need money to build something? I said, you need a vision and a heart. And you need persistence. And money will chase you. What do you think money is waiting for? It's sitting in bank accounts to chase people. That's why money is there. Ever see people with a lot of money? What do you think they're looking for? They're looking for somebody to chase. When they start seeing wisdom, they start seeing prodigy. When they start seeing genius, when they start seeing drive, then they want that person. They said, hey, can I invest with you early? Because I believe in you. Money chases you when you have passion, when you have vision. Please understand that. Many a times people come to me, brother, I want to do this project, but we don't have any money, so you know what? We're not going to do it. I said, how shaitan has fooled you. You think it's money that brings good things? Banu Umayyad had all the money under the sky. What did they do? All they did was build masajids to promote themselves. And they died in time. They built grand mosques, and Allah condemns such places when it's only done to promote the self. Hmm? Allah doesn't like that. It's not money. It's passion. It's a drive. Vision. And all odds are against you. And you say, I don't care. I have a vision. My Lord is infinite. And my vision has to be infinite. And I must set my goals so high that nothing can stop me. For all material things aim in that direction. I promise you. And the minute the ball starts to roll in your direction, now everybody wants to be part of the bandwagon. <laughs> like, how'd you get here? <clears throat> when Mahmoud achieved his, now everybody wants his autograph. Yeah, but when he was a kid, everybody's telling him, no, you can't go there. No, you can't make it. So how does he make it? And when he makes it, now everybody wants his autograph. Everybody wants to stand next to him like, oh, that's the, the, the superstar. But that superstar was being pushed under the water when he was young. What saved him? What made him that powerful a person to reach what he did? And in my opinion, when he reached that status, he went another step higher, which most NBA superstars never go to. He accepted Islam, and he even challenged his own wealth for Allah. And he put his justice up front, and the NBA was going to punish him severely and take all his, you know, uh, notoriety away from him and block him. He says, I don't care. I have a future. And my sacrifice today with the millions that I'm making, and if I'm going to lose it because I believe in God and because I want to reach that higher stage, and if that's the cost to get it, then let me get it. What kind of people do we have in the world like them? Very few. Allah says, رِجَالٌ لَا تُلْهِهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِتَاءِ الزَّكَاةِ يَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا تَتَّقَلَّبُوا فِيهِ الْقُلُوبُ وَالْأَبْصَارِ Men who don't bargain for any price. Why? Because they know the akhirah is with God. The value is with Allah. My vision is eternal. My good is forever. Not for this temporal things that I'm chasing. No, this is taghut if it becomes my goal. If it's a means to a goal, let me get it. If, it, if a billion dollars is a means to my goal, then I will get my billion dollars. If being the president of the world is the means to my goal, then I will be the president of the world. But the goal is Allah. 
فمن يكفر بالتاغوت ويؤمن بالله فقد استمسك بالعروة الوثقى vision so when Mahmoud reaches that stage when you ask him he said it would be thunderstorms outside lightning nobody's outside he said I have made my vision clear my discipline is that I'm going to go out there and I'm going to practice my skill and I'm going to imagine the opposite team I'm going to imagine the guards I'm going to imagine all those that are going to challenge me for me to get to that basket and get my ball in there that imagination was so vivid in his mind where he was so focused that when he started playing in fact when he was young you know in a camp and Michael Jordan was the superstar of the time was the teacher at that time and he called on Mahmoud as a young boy and says come he brought him forward just as to teach the other kids and he said to Mahmoud says okay his name, at that time he was Chris Jackson he says come on dribble this ball and see if you can pass me and each time he would beat Michael Jordan twice he did that and then Jordan told him go sit down he says this kid is too good <laughs> And Mahmoud said, if I could do that now, what can I do tomorrow when this guy is the superstar? His vision was coming true and Allah showed him the signs of it. When you and I have a vision, you'll see the signs show up. It's like hope. God gives you hope and says, ah, you had that thought, you want it, let me show you how it looks. And then you taste it. Oh, wow, that's easy. And he became one of the highest scorers in his era. His three points were untouched in his time. He would lead games with double digit numbers. Nobody could touch him. Why? Vision. And when you ask him, he said, my vision was so clear that I wanted that. Allah says, be careful and see what your self sends tomorrow. Be aware of it. As I mentioned yesterday, reading is an exercise that helps us envision tomorrow. It strengthens our knowledge. It strengthens us to be able to do what we need to do for tomorrow. So in conclusion, I want to, as I mentioned yesterday, I'm going to touch on Surah Al-Waqiyah, the vision. And you will notice, by the way, whenever Allah praises His servants in the Quran of the highest character, He always exposes their vision. For example, Allah says, وَيُتْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا Here, in Surah Al-Dahr, Allah is talking about Ahl al-Bayt. Fatima al-Zahra, salamu Allahi alayha, salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala. You find that, as you know, she vowed to fast for three days. And every time she's about to break the fast, a poor man comes, an orphan comes, a stranger comes and she gives away her food. She said, this person deserves it and she gives it away. And Allah exposes this fantastic behavior filled with vision of the future, filled with patience, with forbearance, with love, with compassion. Because you know, when you and I think of the future carefully and we monitor it carefully, our character will naturally mold in that direction. We will become patient. We will be aware that, hold on, what I'm going to say now may have an impact for tomorrow because I'm always thinking of tomorrow. As Imam Ali salam says, a wise person thinks before they speak. Thinks meaning they project what's going to happen. A fool speaks and then thinks. And you know, Imam Ali salam says, once you speak, it's no longer your property. It's public and you can never reclaim it. When you say something silly and somebody heard you, you can't take, you can say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. You can try to mitigate it, but it's no longer your property and it can and will be used against you. So wise people think before they speak. You know, standing up here on the pulpit speaking is a very, very, uh, I would say it's a responsibility with a tremendous amount of care given the fact that it's recorded and it remains in the archives forever. So what you say 
you better have careful modulation what kind of words you're using but that is the blessings of Allah in that he protects us and we seek refuge with Allah from our own ignorance and stupidity for anything good that is said on this pulpit I bear witness it is Allah's the prophets and the Ahlul Bayt and I bear witness that any silly thing that is said on this pulpit belongs to me Salawat Allah Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Long term. So what does Allah say in Quran Surah Al-Dahr? So they gave charity. Then of course he said, We are feeding you only because of God. Allah is the ultimate good, don't forget. All good starts from him, all good ends with him, which is never ending. It's Allah with all good. So when you say, We give food for God. For He is the good. And everything goes with Him. Then they say further, listen to this. We want no reward from you. Not even thanks. What? You did a great deed. Many of us, when we do something good, we want our names to be recognized. We want people to give us some recognition that this was done by mashallah, fulan bin fulan. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. We thank people when they remember us, but should we do it for being thanked? That's the question. Well, typically, the one who doesn't have such thoughts will want to be thanked. But who doesn't want thanks? This group, the Quran is talking about Surah Al-Dar. La nuridu minkum jaza'an wa la shukura. Inna nakhafu min rabbina we are afraid of that day from our Lord when we will be held liable. See, long-term thinking, day of judgment. Very important. God said, look, why are they like this? They have long-term thinking. They are futuristic. Their actions today have all plans for tomorrow. Everything is built for tomorrow. So Allah says, be careful. Allah says, وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ مَاذَا تَكْسِبُ غَدَى وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتٌ No self knows what they will deliver tomorrow and no self knows on which land they will die. إِنَّ اللَّهَ عِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ السَّعَى وَيُنَزِّلُ الْغَيْثِ وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْأَرْحَامِ It is Allah who knows the time factor, the future, the day of judgment. إِنَّ اللَّهَ عِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ السَّعَى الغيث, he's the one who brings the rain and knows what lies in the wombs of the mothers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, only I know. Here Allah is saying, they think of the future, right? So Allah rewards them. So tonight's lecture is, please see with clarity the future. Let us see ourselves on the day of judgment. Let us see ourselves at the moment Malakul Maut meets us. Let us see ourselves with the Prophet. If you and I don't have those clear visions, our projections of today will be skewed. Guaranteed. And I say it with, with sincerity. But let's go to Surah Al Waqiyah, as I promised you yesterday, and I'm going to end with that. Surah Al Waqiyah is Surah number 56, and I'm going to end it very briefly. Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, إِذَا وَقَعَتِ الْوَاقِعَةِ When the great event comes to pass, لَيْسَ لِوَقَعْتِهَا كَاذِبًا This, you cannot belie. It's a true event, it's coming. Meaning God is saying, have this in your vision. Have it so real, the way Mahmoud had it real, that he is in the NBA as a superstar. You are touching it, it's so real. They say even when Michael Jordan hit one shot, everybody was shocked, how did you do it? He said, it wasn't anything great. I had already thought about it a thousand times before. You know, there's an interesting story when you talk about this, where thoughts, and be careful of those thoughts, how you predict your future. Simple example, and then I'll end with this, Sotawake, sorry, a few more minutes. You find that, you know, it's an interesting story, for about, and I, and I thought about sharing this. When you have future thinking, even temporal, you will be able to control even your temper. 
So there's a story of a man sitting at the airport and there was a bag of cookies and the man sitting next to him. And the man thought that these are his cookies because he bought the same cookies. And he starts taking a cookie, he eats one, but the man sitting next to him takes a cookie from his bag. So the man looks at him, says, hey, he's eating from my bag. It's my cookies. And I think there were five cookies. And you can imagine if you have a bag of cookies, you're sitting at the airport, and somebody comes and puts his hand and pulls the cookie out. We'll say, what are you doing? You know, if, get off, punch him, right? So the guy patiently looks at him and says, he's eating from my cookies. So he takes one, the guy takes one. He takes another one, the guy takes another one. This guy's like, this guy's audacious. You know, he has this temerity to eat from my bag. But it's okay. But now you're controlling yourself. There was one cookie left. He's like wondering, he's not going to take my last cookie. I mean, he should be shameless if he touches my last cookie. Lo and behold, the stranger takes the last cookie and he splits it in half and gives this to the man and he eats the other half. So after the guy is eaten, he gets called to the gate. And he's like fuming, but he's controlling. Fuming, but he's controlling. So he packs up his bags and as he's lifting his bag, he realizes he bought the same bag of cookies, but it was under his bag and he forgot them. So actually those bags, those cookies in the bag was not his, was the stranger's. So he thought the guy is stealing his cookies, but actually he was stealing his cookies. You get it? Subhanallah. But look, if you and I control our temper, then maybe good things will come because you would make yourself into a royal fool if you said, excuse me, you're touching my cookies. And the guy says, no, sir, these are mine. Oh, I'm so sorry. But rather, to mitigate it, when you and I have patience and we bite our tongues, wal qadimin al ghayt, wal afina nin nas, wallah yuhib al muhsinin. They hold back their temper and they forgive mankind. And God loves the good doers. The net outcome is something different. Hmm? Stephen Covey says, I was on a bus and there were a couple of kids running around in the bus. And there was a man sitting there dozing off. And these kids were very rambunctious and making a lot of noise. And he was annoying me. Typical. What are you looking at? What's, what's going on with you? You know, we're angry all the time. Some of us are like taking time bombs. He looks at these kids and says, what kind of a father is this man? You know, uh, does he know how to control his kids? So finally, he has the courage and goes to the man and says, excuse me, can you do something with your kids? They're out of control. What's going on? He says, oh, I'm sorry. Their mother just died. We just buried her. And these are my kids. I don't know what to do with them now. I'm a bit dazed. And he said, from my anger, I flipped to empathy, to sympathy. And I felt embarrassed. For the situation was miscalculated by me. So imagine a wise person who thinks the future says, these kids are this. I wonder if they have a problem. Instead of saying, can you please correct them? He says, can I help you? Is there any way I can help your children? It's a different approach. How did you say, can I help you versus saying, fix your children? You had long-term thinking. You said, maybe this person has this. So Turwaqiya is exemplifying that. He says, when the earth shall be shaken, إِذَا رُجَّتِ الْأَرْضُ رَجَّمْ وَبُسْتَتِ الْجِبَالُ بَسْتًا فَكَانَتْ حَبَاءً مُنْبَثًا وَكُنْتُمْ مَزْوَاجًا ثَلَاثًا when this earth will crumble and be crushed and the mountains will be brought down, scientists all agree that the earth will be crushed and destroyed with the sun. 100%. Allah is saying, that day. And now you are there on the day of judgment and you'll be broken into three groups. Allah says, huh? He says, فَأَصْحَابُ الْمَيْمَنَةِ مَا أَصْحَابُ الْمَيْمَنَةِ وَأَصْحَابُ الْمَشْأَمَةِ مَا أَصْحَابُ الْمَشْأَمَةِ والسابقون السابقون أولئك المقربون في جنات النعيم I end here tonight a vision three groups will be broken on the day of judgment three groups people of the right hand not right hand people who are good people of the left hand people who committed sins and evil and then the foremost of the foremost God honors the foremost and says that group will not be questioned on judgment day they will enter paradise Tomorrow, I'll, I mean next week, I'll continue discussing on Thursday. This surah, Sutul Waqia, the vision of the Day of Judgment and how the good doers will be met on Judgment Day, a vision you and I should have clearly in our heads. And among the three, 
you and I all should target the third group. Sadiqun as sadiqun, foremost. Don't say, I just want to put my foot into paradise. Say, I want to be the foremost of the foremost. I want to enter the highest stations of paradise. How do I get there? I want to be the one where God welcomes me with such honor and dignity, but there's a price to pay. There's a lifestyle to lead. And there is a lot that you and I must give up in order to achieve it, but you and I also will achieve greatness if we focus on it. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة تعز بها الإسلام وأهله وتذل بها النفاق وأهله وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة إلى تعتك والقادة إلى سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة وآخر الدعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته My respected brothers and sisters tonight we also have iftar those of you who wish to join and sit and join with us, we'll be honored to have you with us. After Salah, inshallah, we'll be doing Salatul Jama'ah, and then we will have Iftar. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.